Uh, hi everybody. So we're going to get under. We're going to get underway. Um, thanks, thanks for coming. And uh, this room is surprisingly warm, um, given the sort of Siberian conditions that we normally experience. And I don't know what what it means that the room is warmer than usual, but uh, it's it's got something to do with these two guys. Um, yes, it's two guys, uh, two architects. Um, actually have many things in common, I think, and many differences, and I suppose tonight we can dance between what's common and what's uh, di different, um, a kind of ex-dean and a new dean, um, sort of sort of bookends on the whole deanly thing, um, victims of being dean uh, uh, for a while, um, which means also pedagogues, um, also uh, architects, professional architects, uh, also writers, uh, thinkers, uh, also people who have managed to produce a certain confusion between their work as writers, their work as, as thinkers, if we can make a difference, their work as uh, teachers and their work as designers. And, and they're able to move uh, up and down that uh, slide along that scale in, in ways that other people can't uh, do. But I think what matters to me most about, the, um, about these two guys is that, is that they also are part of what I think is a very, quite a small group within our field of, um, uh, of conceptual thinkers, by which I mean conceptual in the sense of conceptual art, which is to say an, an incredible ability to take very complex situations and trajectories and identify uh, key tendencies or patterns in those and then abstract a situation down to a concept, uh, one concept that could be placed in some kind of vibration with another concept. And so you see it you see it very, very clear in the way they think and the way they uh, write. Uh, also in common is, is a kind of uh, writing their way into architecture that, they, that it's through, through the, like so many significant figures in our field, they come to us th through their writings. I mean, maybe you know it so well already with Bernard, but maybe less well you know that Alejandro was, was writing a lot um, before being known as an architect and, and even more especially, I think, interviewing architects a lot. Uh, uh, and writing about those interviews and turning those interviews into kind of statements. And at some point, I don't know when it happened exactly, he stops interviewing people and, and actually he's the one doing the writing in his own name and then he's the one being interviewed. So he kind of goes from from interviewing architects to uh, and writing about that to becoming a writer, to becoming an architect, to being interviewed about the writing. And, and, and Bernard has actually done, gone through that a number of times and has actually worked that cycle uh, very, very productively in uh, London, in uh, New York, in Paris, and, and in a sense keeps this thing going in permanent uh, oscillation. So it's not as if writing is the precursor to practice and practice is only interesting in as much as it then gets written about. There is actually a kind of conceptual work uh, uh, going on here at work here. So I think it's, it's uh, really a special evening for us that these two will, in a way, exchange thoughts um, uh, again, Bernard with a great book that has just come out, and by great I mean great, uh, um, and by red I mean, you know, red, and it's not Little Red Book at all, uh, although it may have a relationship to the Little Red Book in the kind of conceptual spirit, and, and um, Alejandro with, with an eternally forthcoming book that in theory has, has emerged a, a number of times, and it could turn out that this book is a sort of... Uh, uh, the, is a sort of a fantasy, and, and, that, and that 10 years from now he will finally declare that there'll be no such book. Uh, I don't think he'll do that because, of course, that's a trick that Peter Eisenman used for about 20 years with Tarani, um, and there finally was a book. And actually, I don't think anybody has read or seen the book. So the story about the possibility of the book was even greater. Anyway, I'm speaking too long because it's been much nicer to listen to them. The basic format is 20 minutes from one of them, 20 minutes from the other, 20 minutes together, and then some time with you. Uh, and, and anyway, I think, uh, Bernard, you're first. But that thought was not very good. Uh, Alejandro's first. First of all, uh, I would like to say that when I was, was first invited to be here, I thought that uh, I was going to be the curtain raiser for Bernard's book, uh, since I already had, had the, the, the opportunity to uh, introduce my book a number of times, despite the fact that it's not yet uh, um, published. 
how can I enlarge this? Okay. Um, so uh, I I I was um, uh, very pleased to be uh, uh, the curtain raiser for Bernard's book uh, tonight. But uh, a couple of days ago, he told me that I was that this was supposed to be a double bill, uh, which uh, which I don't know whether I I deserve. But uh, so in, in any case, I am happy to be uh, the curtain raiser. I think that's uh, the, the uh, role that uh, I need to take today. And hopefully, we'll have a jam session with uh, Mark as the, uh, the bass or the kind of uh, the core of the, of the, of the group. Uh, the Sniper's Log is uh, a little experiment that uh, I have uh, tried to produce into a, into a certain type of book which aims to be um, a kind of mix or uh, a cross between different genres. Uh, if, if you think about uh, uh, how architects have been uh, addressing writing, some of them have done manifestos or manuals or critiques. And in some ways, the book that I am presenting today is, uh, is a mixture of all of them and is uh, uh, specifically a textbook, despite the fact that there are images. Later on, we'll get uh, to, the, to the role of the images in the, <coughs> in the book. It's a compilation of, uh, of what I call uh, textual artifacts. Uh, uh, and that uh, means that uh, uh, there are texts that were written for particular commissions or in order to perform in certain situations and try to uh, act upon the situations where the texts were uh, to be uh, deployed. So uh, there, there, there are in some ways uh, opportunistic uh, texts. Uh, there are haphazard. Uh, there is no uh, strategic battle plan about the book. It's a, it's a kind of... Uh, uh, compilation of tactical uh, moments in which these textual artifacts um, uh, are deployed onto different uh, situations. <coughs> uh, uh, and that's why the book is called The Sniper's Log, because I see it as a series of uh, shots at certain uh, opportunities, certain moments uh, through my career uh, where I had to use the textual uh, form in order to uh, perform parts of my my duties or my role as a, as an architect. Uh, now, the, actually, the only thing that links all these texts is me, uh, and and this uh, became actually quite uh, uh, evident at the beginning of the of the construction of the of the book, and became <clears throat> also the reason why. Uh, uh, once I started doing the, the compilation, I became particularly interested in the possibility that, uh, uh, mm, that the book should say something about the connection between the construction of, uh, of a theory or a series of theories and some sort of uh, biographical uh, path. Um, uh, I mean, later on, I hope to have the, the possibility of discussing this with, with Bernard, but I think that uh, maybe one of the reasons why we still do books is because we want to construct some sort of uh, 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 public persona uh, in, the, in the field. And, and, and therefore, I thought that to reflect again, however megalomaniac and pretentious may sound to do a, a biography, I thought that it was worth uh, uh, exploring this kind of dangerous territory. Uh, and then immediately, I, I thought that I needed um, an alibi to, uh, uh, to address the book in, in, such, a, in, in such a way. <coughs> and um, and uh, then is when I started thinking that perhaps it would be more interesting to locate this compilation of texts in uh, not, not just on myself, but use myself as a vehicle to uh, uh, try to explain uh, a whole generation, a whole moment in the, in, in the, in the history, perhaps, of the, of the discipline, where the book would try to capture the zeitgeist, and, and, and maybe not only the, the zeitgeist, but in, in my particular case, the, the genius loci of 
global culture, which was something that emerged uh, uh, very much uh, with, with a very uh, uh, strong force uh, during my um, uh, my life and, or my, my, my professional life. So in some ways, the, the generation uh, was also a way of moving out or, or acting as, a, as an antidote against this uh, uh, intensification of authorship that uh, has been gripping the architectural uh, culture for a few uh, decades. And, and that's when the, 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 combination, the combination between uh, the uh, uh, interest in biography and the interest in uh, uh, the generation uh, became uh, the, 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 the system, the, the groove of the, of the, of the book. Um, I then started reading about, about uh, um, uh, generations, uh, became interested in the, in the subject, came, uh, came to uh, maybe I'm going to stop this uh, series of slides, which uh, later on we, we will uh, explain why they are there. Uh, let me see if I can open the PDF. It's here. Uh, so I, I became interested in the, in the question of the, of the generation, and I found a, a book um, that is, uh, is called... Um, See if I can. So I became interested in, 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 in this idea of the, of the generation and started thinking, so who is my generation? Find, found out that I am part or I'm, I'm an early member of what, what is known as the uh, Generation X uh, that has uh, counts uh, amongst, uh, these, these, are, these are images, all the material that I'm gonna show is kind of preparatory ma material for the, for the book. So you can see how the concept of the book uh, evolved, so there are people like Nick Lesson or Kurt Cobain or Julian Assange. I mean, uh, it, it is, and, and so I, I, I realized that uh, <clears throat> Generation X uh, is, is full of kind of dodgy people, uh, or sort of uh, uh, dodgy people, people with some sort of, uh, and, and, and then I, I came across uh, this uh, book, uh, written by uh, Strauss and Hogg, which is called Generations, the History of American uh, Future, uh, that explains uh, that uh, Generation X belongs to uh, one of the four typologies of generations that uh, they identify as, uh, as a, in, in some sort of uh, cycle uh, that goes from the prophets uh, to the nomads, to the heroes, and to the artists. So uh, Bernard, for example, will be a prophet, and I am a nomad. Uh, following that categorization, which I don't know whether it is relevant, but maybe uh, this is uh, perhaps something that we can that we can uh, uh, discuss <coughs> uh, during the uh, during the uh, debate. Uh, I, I thought that uh, uh, it was interesting to discover that I sort of felt more or less comfortable within, within that, uh, that uh, description that uh, uh, Strauss and Ho make, make of, of uh, the, gen the generation. Then I, uh, so I had the texts, I had a, a compilation of uh, texts that, that I had to organize and I thought that in order to explain in the book uh, or in order to frame the book, I was going to use um, images. Those images that I, that I was showing before are images that have happened during my, my lifetime, and I've been selecting those that uh, I felt were more important or, or more uh, interesting uh, for me. And uh, uh, those uh, images uh, are placed in the book as some sort of background. They, they don't necessarily relate, literally, to explain what is written in the texts, but they try to establish different types of uh, attachments uh, to the text. Sometimes they are um, they are uh, aligned with the content of the texts. They explain something that is being uh, said in the in the text. Sometimes, for example, they are uh, ironic or they contradict uh, the the texts as a kind of uh, uh, further revision or further consideration about what I. Uh, uh, put uh, in the in the text from the from the uh, at the moment when the texts uh, were written. Some of these texts are uh, nearly 
20 years old. I think the first text uh, date back from, from probably 86 or, or something like, like that. So uh, the, the, the first ideas about the book was to use the text as a, as a, as a sort of uh, uh, background, uh, but, uh, but then thinking about uh, uh, how this would work in a, in a book that was mainly about the, 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 these written uh, uh, textual uh, artifacts, um, uh, I started uh, thinking that, or we started thinking that the, the, the graphic designers were, were uh, key in that, uh, in that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just showing you the first iterations of the book, where the images are literally the background uh, to the texts, where sometimes they, they display uh, uh, things that relate to what is written, and sometimes they... Uh, <clears throat> they are acting uh, against uh, or they are, are uh, supposed to uh, uh, produce a certain irony uh, about what is uh, written in the in the text and and the images have to do with characters have to do with uh, events uh, have to do with uh, technologies that perhaps emerge during my uh, life uh, time uh, technologies that are, uh, range from older technologies with some sort of iconographic uh, content that existed already uh, uh, during my 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 uh, early life and technologies that emerge after after that events uh, uh, processes uh, the, the race of chip travel uh, aids uh, the 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 spread of uh, or the the globalization of uh, local foods uh, the construction of some sort of uh, artificial uh, um, chemistry for, for human uh, beings, crowds, uh, 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 urban landscapes. Uh, sometimes I use also some of my own projects uh, when, I, when I think uh, are relevant uh, in some way to the, uh, to the text. So for example, in, in some cases you see that there is a kind of literal uh, illustration of the, of the text. Uh, this is the moment in which the text uh, moves from being a background which would have made probably very difficult to read those texts to being a staple. So the, the images moved from that kind of atmospheric role, uh, or let's say try to produce the, this atmospheric role by becoming staples that would uh, fix the, the text to a certain uh, age, to a certain uh, set of events or characters that uh, were uh, relevant in one way or another to, to uh, my own uh, uh, thinking. And you see that they take different rhythms. It's almost like a line. Sometimes there is only one staple. Sometimes there are many uh, staples. And, and sometimes they are more uh, random. Uh, they don't necessarily relate. Uh, I mean, this is what I was explaining before. For example, Peter Eisenman's uh, illustrations, uh, the, 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 the illustrations of Peter's uh, text uh, written <clears throat> for the clock is in 97 or 96 has to do with the artificial and therefore it's a kind of uh, opportunity to uh, 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 display a number of uh, chemical artifacts that uh, have appeared uh, during my my lifetime or uh, you know I, I mean it's uh, it's uh, uh, the, the 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 types of attachments that occur between the images and the text are in some way contingent and I am using them in order to modulate uh, the, the content of the, of the uh, text. I'm, I'm moving uh, uh, quickly through, uh, through this. You, you can see, uh, in a way, how this, uh, this uh, works. Um, uh, uh, and, and so the book has four sections. Then the texts are classified in four sections. The first one is called Global Positioning Systems, and those are texts uh, that are, um, <clears throat> are written in my early career, uh, and are ma many of the texts that I wrote for El Croquis, uh, whose main purpose uh, uh, as weapons, if you, if you want, were, uh, was, the, 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 uh, the, was a way of positioning myself within the contemporary culture of architecture uh, at the at the time, and so there is there, there is a number of uh, uh, texts uh, which many of them are uh, in a way uh, critiques that I wrote um, very early on 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 other architects and that helped me to position myself uh, within 
the, uh, the contemporary discipline. The, the, the second section is called Reading Sciences, and those are texts that have more to do with my, uh, say, academic engagements with uh, the, the text that I wrote uh, specifically to um, uh, address, for example, uh, conferences or uh, studio briefs or, uh, uh, you know, there are things here. For example, this is the, my, my brief to the last studio I taught here when uh, Bernard uh, invited me, uh, I think in 2001, uh, that I did a, a, a studio on typologies, was called Back to the Hardcore, is here. So there are a, a number of texts that address this type of uh, environments, if, if you want. Uh, the third text is, uh, is called Nomad Practice, and, and they are mainly texts written uh, about my own practice as, a, as an architect, and sometimes there are, uh, there are uh, theorizations of books, like, uh, I don't know, the text for phylogenesis or for the virtual house, but also uh, other, uh, other texts that uh, are sometimes the, the, the memo, uh, a memo, an internal memo, for example, for the Olympic project. Uh, that uh, I, I thought it was interesting to include in this uh, uh, series of texts. And the, the last uh, chapter of the book is called Material Politics, and it has to do with, in some ways, uh, the realization that uh, as part of a certain generation that had deliberately uh, uh, frozen uh, uh, the engagement with the political discourse, uh, I needed in some ways to balance that and, and, and uh, probably the last uh, part of my uh, writing career uh, was very much uh, about uh, trying to understand what, uh, what may be the political agency of uh, architectural uh, practice. So there are, in this case, many of the, of the uh, for example, introductory texts uh, to the Berlage Institute lecture series uh, where we talk about uh, architecture and power or mediators or rethinking representation issues that had to do with practice but address in some way uh, uh, some sort of, uh, of uh, uh, transfer between uh, regimes of power and the, the, the practice of, uh, of uh, architecture. Uh, uh, and, and, and there are so the, the, there are four sections, and then within these four sections, the texts are have nine different templates, and uh, some uh, templates have to do with uh, the templates are, are uh, differentiated by using uh, serif or sans serif. Uh, they are differentiated by the space of the margins. They are differentiated by uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the space, uh, the, 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 the justification, sometimes it's justified, non-justified. There are uh, uh, sometimes, uh, um, for example, more journalistic uh, 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 typologies of, uh, of uh, graphic design with, uh, with columns, with two columns instead of one. So deliberately within these four categories, the texts have uh, or belong to a different uh, uh, function. Sometimes they are epistolar, sometimes they are uh, theoretical, sometimes they are memos, uh, and the, the, the graphic layout of the text have, uh, has to do with, uh, with that. So uh, the purpose of this is that you, you have all kinds of strange encounters between the graphic design, the images, and the content of the texts, and those are in some ways contingent. They are, they are perhaps less, less deliberate than, 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 than I would have wanted, but at the same time, they open uh, many possible uh, readings of the, of the book. This is, for example, the back of uh, To the Hardcore, which is the brief of uh, uh, Columbia Studio, or there are also uh, uh, three uh, interviews uh, in the in the in the book, and and finally the end of the of the book uh, is a series of uh, more uh, generic reflections about these textual artifacts. This is the real sniper's log where uh, uh, it is written the the date, uh, uh, the location, uh, and the domain where those textual artifacts were. 
uh, deployed. Um, uh, there is also something that was actually quite fun to do, uh, which is to try to see uh, uh, from the events uh, that happened uh, since I was born in, in 63, which are the events that, uh, that uh, I thought were important for me or affected in some ways uh, my perception of the, of the world. And it's interesting to see uh, how uh, the, the, the older uh, years, they are obviously not literal memories, but, but almost like references that later on you have become interested in there are uh, uh, within I mean, obviously these references are not uh, comprehensive they have to they are filtered through my uh, perception so there are things like i don't know the the the, the foundation of uh, ecm records uh, for me that is important and is there maybe for nobody else uh, and so uh, uh, that's the, the the another one of the of the devices that the book contains that uh, uh, thread through the different uh, materials contained in the in the book, and the final one is a is a glossary where, uh, as it uh, often happens with uh, with websites, the the terms uh, have been scaled to the to the importance or to the number of times that uh, they have been uh, uh, used in the in the book. So you can and, and also some of the terms are literally uh, treated as. Uh, quotes or statements. So uh, uh, there are there are. I'm not interested in the virtual architecture, but in the virtual in architecture, uh, there are a number of of uh, statements that I thought uh, uh, the limits of freedom are more interesting than the possibilities. Uh, uh, there are statements that I I, th I thought were interesting and and in some way uh, uh, representative of of the the content of the of the book. So uh, this is basically what the sniper's log uh, is. I, I don't, I don't really um, have uh, much more to uh, explain. I hope that it will uh, one day be published. Although I, I'm, 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 I'm uh, considering that maybe if I extend it a couple of years more, it will become even more interesting. Those copies that are uh, around there are some sort of digital um, uh, copies, uh, and I, I am now uh, giving uh, the 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 microphone to the main guest uh, and player of the night. I'm supposed to set up his PDF <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or his PowerPoint, actually. Uh, I, I know how to do it. Eh? OK, Bernard. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, tonight's <coughs> subject, in a way, is uh, you know how do you write a book, and when do you do that, and why do you do it? And uh, uh, we thought that possibly uh, comparing two different approaches, but which actually, uh, as Mark said have a certain amount of things in common, not necessarily because of the two protagonists of tonight, but maybe because of the time we live in. But of course, one's histories may be different. Uh, as um, Alejandro said very well, there are certain generations, but what is a generation? We might talk about it uh, uh, afterwards. And uh, there are certain questions which are raised. Why do you do this? And also, actually, why do you work? And perhaps a book is exactly the way to start to answer this type of question. But before I start to get into that, well, we, before one starts getting into these issues, let me just read a little text. You still frequently get asked, why are the folio red? Why not yellow and orange? Why not different colors for different events or meanings? At first, you just refused to answer the question. You said, I never answered that question. Then you got bored with what you said because red is not a color, right? So you said, yeah. So right, it's mysterious. You left it at that. 
and then you started to do other objects and you were not going to use red in them. <coughs> Otherwise, people wouldn't hire you because they thought that your buildings were going to be red. <laughs> but not only that, that's not the real reason. You started to think that each project had a concept. The issue was how to reinforce the concept. You decided that the use of color would be a mean of reinforcing the concept. So at Le Frenoir, uh, we, where you had a, a new roof over the old roof. Ah, I'm sorry. You can read it on the wall. Um, uh, oops, go back, I finished that. Um, uh, so at the Frenois, where you had a new roof over the old roof, but also had walkways, all these vectors of movements, those, those got bright artificial colors. Now the color of the material has a color. The concrete has a color, the wood has a color, the brick has a color, but this specific color is intentionally artificial. So when you answered red is not a color, you meant to be more than provocative. For you, it was what makes architecture concepts. So why concepts? That's a bit too early to discuss right now because that's really, although that's in the introduction of the book, that's really the conclusion that architecture is about making concept and material. It's about concept and ideas and about materializing them. It's a form of knowledge, but we'll come back to, to that later. So the question is, how do you start? And how do you start is not so much a question about the book, but it's about how do you start anything? And what is there, you know, as a series of conditions that really determine why and how do you start. So imagine, imagine that you are a young architect or even not before you even are an architect, you have some knowledge about architecture, you have, you know, you may have traveled, you may have seen quite great monuments or some great cities, or you have simply watched them in photographs or on television. You go to architecture school, you, uh, you do it uh, with a great deal of interest, uh, but at the same time you feel that some of the things are a little restrictive, you know, the, uh, the way uh, you draw, for example, the, the, the architectural convention of drawing, uh, uh, at this time, at that time, the axonometric or the, the plan, the section, still now, you know, tend to have certain restriction. You take them into consideration, you have a, um, uh, you do your thesis, uh, you have been in a good school, but the thesis is not quite what they expected and they grumbled a bit. Uh, so you, at the same time, you realize that something else is happening out there and it's the 1968 events, which are a major set of questionings. It's not so much the events themselves, but it's the question they raised. In other words, at, at one moment, suddenly, uh, for a whole group of people, uh, it meant that uh, nothing was taken for granted. So you wonder why architecture Sure, they have quite the impressive things. You know, the Twin Towers are just being under construction, and while you like them, and always did, you question the nature of what architecture really is. So you stop drawing, you stop writing, you stop drawing, rather, you stop thinking exclusively as an architect, because you want to see whether there is something else. You read a lot, you read, of course, uh, like what we all read. You read uh, Foucault, you read Deleuze, you read Roland Barthes. Only later you read Derrida because it's a lot harder than the other ones. <laughs> and you are, you know, you're visual, and uh, so you look at uh, at artworks, uh, the works, the artworks that are at the time universally despised, like Henry Moore. You know. Uh, and uh, the artwork which is interest, uh, uh, which is a matter of interest, uh, like um, you know, conceptual artists, Cotus, Dick Bergen, and many others. Uh, this is really what somehow makes you feel that there is a possible link 
between what you were interested in when you first started to study architecture, but maybe to try to address it from the periphery and not from the center, from the margins. And hence, you also have another thing about you know, the word architecture. The word architecture is loaded with cultural connotations. It's loaded with an enormous history. And that's a little problematic when you want to start from scratch. So you think about maybe space, maybe the body, maybe movement in space, and how we can also do something that you haven't learned at school, which is, you know, section, elevations, and perspectives. Uh, it's a form of notation about the movement of bodies in space. So this interests you, and it interests you also because of things which are also on the periphery, like uh, film, for example, or certain form of artworks on the bottom right, a piece with, uh, done with uh, the artist Robert Longo, which uh, in many ways was part of a conversation that was taking place at the time. We are now in New York, and uh, at the time when uh, uh, the city is actually going under and everything is up for grab. You're trying, you're trying desperately to uh, find an entry to uh, that uh, question of space and movement. And one day you come across this quite extraordinary mode of notation, uh, Eisenstein's uh, uh, score for uh, uh, Alexander Nevsky, and your first drawing, you have stopped drawing literally for five or seven years, five years, and you, uh, you, you take this as the starting point of an architectural drawing that could simultaneously show events, spaces, and movement, space, event, movement. And so you, that gives you an entry, an entry to, a, to an architecture that is about uh, vectors and movements, vectors and, 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 and spaces, uh, the carpenter center, uh, or pieces from, from, from of course, uh, uh, various films. And a, a number of, uh, suddenly a, a universe opens up uh, a Bible is uh, there, it's uh, uh, the, the haunted screen by an extraordinary uh, uh, film historian, Lotte Eisner, talking about expressionist film, but of course early avant-garde cinema. And you realize that the avant-garde, the early avant-garde of the 20th century is still filled with unexplored uh, issues which architects have never looked at. We also look, you realize that things are changing. The white wall of the gallery is not necessarily the starting point. The, uh, uh, the, the dancer, Tricia Browns, uh, uh, uses roofs full of obstacles in order to develop her work. And you start to think that maybe architecture is not something that has to do with uh, a, a, a history that you absolutely have to expand, but that you can challenge uh, the basic preconceived notions that architecture brings. So architecture is not about the spaces, but also about what happens in them. Uh, and nevertheless, nevertheless, you think that possibly a certain architecture without architects are worth learning something from. So how to get there where you don't want to start from, you don't want to get, you want to get there but you don't want to start from there. So the advertisements for architecture then are a form of, uh, the, uh, you write a number of te texts uh, for various magazines, they ask you to do more and you say next time I do one I want you to put, to put one you know, an advertisement in it. So you engage with the media by trying to find a polemical way, you will not, you will use the word manifesto, but you hesitate in doing so, and you do it in order to determine what would be those moments when 
when you don't want to call it architecture, uh, but when maybe you can encounter from a fresh perspective what it is. So you ask questions, that's all you do. You're not proposing anything. You ask questions, you do performances. Teaching is always interesting because it's always a form of lab with your students. You try to, uh, you do performances, you do certain uh, exercises which have very much to do with the question that you're asking. And in that laboratory, you just explore, you investigate. And these forms of investigation take a lot of different ways. Again, one doesn't want to start uh, with this center of architecture, but from the margin. And also you see, if architecture is about a, a, a processed culture, uh, maybe we should then start with culture directly. Why don't we start with literature? Why don't we look at Edgar Allan, uh, Allan, Edgar Allan Poe, or uh, Italo Calvino, or Hermann Hesse, or even James Joyce? And you take these as programs, or as starting points, as briefs, and you test again certain hypotheses. Uh, James Joyce Garden was one of these, uh, and uh, the, uh, the difficulty of it was that you have to a student, you don't know how you're going to organize them, so you take a, 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 a map in, in London, it is called the Admiralty Map, and you simply make a point grid out of it. And because you sense that it's really difficult for the students, you do the project yourself as well. So you do this project, you sort of like that notion of those e uh, points of intensities that happen, and you develop them uh, whenever you have a chance. You, New York at the time is dealing with artists that do so-called site-specific sculptures. You are asked to do one and another and another, and you call them in a slightly ironical mode, uh, follies, you don't think at all what will happen to you four years later, but you just explore. You explore and you do it always with a distance because you need to know what you're doing. So in order to find out what you're doing, you write about it. You write about it and because, of course, write because whenever you write, you read, uh, it gives you further ideas and you continue exploring uh, and extending, extending, for example, the notion of sequence. If you talk about movement in architecture, then inevitably you talk about sequence and our, the history of architecture, now we're into history, uh, is filled with amazing sequences. But of course, filmic sequences are just as exciting and that's really where you want to start. So you look at the movement of protagonist in an old movie, uh, Dr. Frankenstein and his monster, you notate the movement vectors, you start to turn them into solids, uh, not unlike what people uh, did in the Bauhaus, Oskar Schlemmer, for example, and slowly you solidify the movement, you turn it into the... So there you are. You're sort of flirting with architecture, but you're not quite doing it. You theorize, but you take a distance. Uh, you try to then bo become more ambitious. Uh, you tend to think, you test certain uh, notions which have to do with uh, uh, urban artifacts, because if architecture is suspect, the city is pure. So the city is fine. So Manhattan is where you are. So you take uh, the park, the street, and when you do the street, you realize that if you do a drawing that's 32, me 32 feet long, it forces the viewer to walk along the drawing. In other words, there is no way it can be a simple uh, 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 one single image. It is a sequence of images. And that notion of the sequence uh, is then becomes the work itself. Uh, so uh, uh, whether it's the horizontal sequence, the vertical sequence of movement, or then a combination of both when you start dealing with a block and then a relatively complex uh, deal of operations which have to do with superposition, su um, uh, juxtapositions, program, uh, movement, 
spaces, all of them being merged into one another because, again, you are suspicious of the notion of category and of, uh, space will inevitably contaminate a program or an event uh, and vice versa. So you, you theorize sometimes before the fact, sometimes after the fact, and at one moment you feel, aha, huh, now maybe I'm onto something. So you decide to take a, um, a, a competition, uh, you enter it, uh, against all odds you win it, and you, by the way, uh, someone who wrote about the abattoir, the slaughterhouses of La Villette, is none else than Georges Bataille, who, whom you had written about a few years earlier as you were talking about transgression. So you are somehow in a new territory, but not so new. Uh, you start to also to realize you're part of your time. Now I have to say, La Villette is 1982. A few years earlier, uh, Colin Rowe had written a book which had a major importance on the whole postmodernist and historicist postmodernist generation. And he makes an opposition between uh, uh, um, uh, quite a beautiful town in, uh, in, in Spain, uh, which is about uh, street and plazas and colonnade, and he opposes it to the famous Plan Voisin of Le Corbusier, which is a point grid. And uh, so uh, the whole architectural scene, uh, uh, it's not only Bob Stern, but it's Prince Charles, it's Paul Goldberger, is really into this uh, contextualism uh, uh, and historicism. So inevitably you think if everybody hates Le Corbusier so much, it must be something, there must be something in it. And if the point grid is evil, well, why don't we try the point grid? So you uh, superimpose those movement vectors, those points, of course, at another scale, and those artificial or rather arbitrary rather movements. And the superimpositions give you the park, one knows the project. But maybe what is important is to know that uh, it's a sort of barometer of the thought at the time. On the left uh, is a project by Leon Cree, actually designed six years before the real La Villette competition for the same site. Uh, quite an extraordinary project, which uh, uh, absolutely amazed uh, uh, your, all your friends uh, and has an incredible influence. So six years later, when uh, people like myself or here, OMA and Ram Kulhas develop the scheme, they all have that uh, a CREA scheme in, 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 in their sort of behind their head. They do that and uh, at the same time, it marks really the, fir the beginning of a shift uh, from that very, uh, uh, very mainstream establishment of historical postmodernism. The park uh, is known, you explore a number of, of devices called explosion, called uh, dis, di, disjunction and so on. That's where you uh, become uh, a little more familiar with the writing of Jacques Derrida. Uh, you think it would be a good idea to have a few conversations with, with, with him, you know you have already won the competition. And you, you are trying, you, have, you are in a major battle with the landscape architects in France who have never um, uh, forgiven you for having won the largest park in Paris since the 19th century. So you decide to organize a series of gardens and to invite your friends. Uh, so uh, some were artists, uh, Daniel Buren and, and, and others. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, you ask Peter Eisenman and Jacques Derrida to design, to draw a garden together. Uh, I'll come to that back in a minute. Uh, the, uh, so you test things out. You actually have never built a thing. You'd have no idea. You worked 
as an intern in an architectural office, but that's not a reason to know much about how to put things together. So you learn on the job, and you learn on the job, which is always very useful because <laughs> uh, you uh, are fearless. Since you don't know how difficult it is, you go ahead. You go, you even learn about trees and about plants, and you continue using the same devices, the devices of sequences, for example. So the promenade of garden is a sequence, is a cinematic sequence. And that's where Peter, Peter Eisenman and Jacques Lerida work and develop almost a project in a project, a sort of palimpsest on the uh, on Navillet. On, on and the, the, the garden was unfortunately never built. They were vastly over budget, and it's not Derrida's fault. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the work, the work uh, continues to explore something which is take its distance away from architecture, and yet is always, is it there, is it not? So you think you write, you, that intermingling of the writing and the Act, action, the events is important. You try to invent new modes of notation uh, for here for fireworks, and of course the fireworks just uh, the guys who do the fireworks don't understand a word and all that, and they ask you to speak English, and so you just eventually do it. And then you move, you you start to get closer to to this issue of what happens in a building, and. You, you don't like quite the idea of the program in itself. Uh, the, this photograph from, uh, 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 I think it was New York Times, and I don't never, you never find you know, the name of the photographer, uh, is, uh, is it a church? Is it a basketball arena? Is it a voting booth? Uh, so you, and when you do the book, you decide to take those examples and to put them in those, uh, uh, blue uh, and white uh, with white lettering pages and I was amused to see um, um, Alejandro using the same device uh, just for a few for one of his chapters so you this here it's the place where you distance yourself from uh, your own work you try to have an overview of what architecture does in relationship to program. And you devise a theory that there's uh, three relationships, either a relationship of reciprocity, when it fits exactly, the program fits exactly, like the ki cooking in the kitchen, a uh, relationship of indifference, like in a warehouse, or a relationship of conflict, like skating in your living room. And these three relationships become fascinating because it gets back to the idea of filmmaking. Uh, Kuleshov, uh, one of the Russian, uh, Russian avant-garde cinema uh, heroes, uh, test in the montage uh, technique uh, to put uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, absolutely still a, a face of an actor, but juxtaposed to a casket, juxtaposed to a bowl of soup, juxtaposed to a, 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 a beautiful woman. And he does it uh, so that he can ask his audience, what do you feel when you read that, what do you read on the expression on the, of, the, uh, of the, the actor, and they say sadness, hunger, lust. You guess, of course, what it is. It's always the same face. And you understand that in architecture, maybe it's the same. And that the collision of activities that the, 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 um, the, that a city demonstrates is also what any building can demonstrate. And this church that many of you probably know, uh, which is now a, a, a shopping mall, has been a pizza parlor and a famous nightclub and a furniture uh, repository, etc. So each of these things are ways to allow you to explore it further. Program becomes a, 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 an endless source of exploration, but not so much because you're trying to invent a new type 
of, 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 of program, you're rather interested in the juxtaposition, the superimposition, and the contamination of programs. After all, you all go to airports and you know what it has become shopping malls and hotels and various other conference centers. So the idea of trans programming is, of course, tempting. You enter a competition, a library, and you have, uh, you say, the athlete of the 20th century will be, of uh, the 21st century will be an intellectual and vice versa. Uh, you get kicked out of the competition. Inevitably, you continue. Do you do other competitions, uh, turning airports into, um, into, um, uh, uh, cities, linear cities, uh, cities are always that fascinating part as if, again, as if the city was innocent while architecture was guilty. And uh, so uh, you even get eventually second prizes and finally after eight years after la uh, losing competition after La Villette you start winning them again. And Le Frenois uh, is an interesting case because it's an existing building which is meant to be torn down. You decide not to tear it down because you think that those uh, messy uh, roofs and all that is, you know, actually has a charm of its own and you can afford more spaces out of those than if you were starting from scratch. And you superimpose, again superimposition, a large roof over it and you do it uh, so that it generates spaces which are accidental, which are not composed. The big enemy word is composition. You do not want to compose, and you simply want to use a conceptual strategy that will generate uh, this architecture. You don't even want to compose to such an extent that you hate the notion of facade, so you don't have facades, and you take simply, and the, for the first time, it's 1991, you use without thinking the word envelope, you use the roof that becomes the facade as it folds over. So the set of strategies are not compositional, they're not architectural, uh, they are somehow leading to a project. You, be, you begin, to, you start to theorize it. At the same time, you realize that that issue of movement and spaces, when you are an architect, the spaces have to be, oops, sorry, the spaces have to be uh, uh, enclosed. When we started to have the first uh, new structure course here at Columbia in, I think, in uh, around uh, uh, 92 or so, we called it, we called, we didn't call it structure, we called it enclosures, uh, enclosures and environment, so that one could talk about HVAC and structure. So the issue was how do you avoid to have those preconceived notion that the culture of architecture has given you through the ages. Of course, Baki is fantastic because the architects of the previous generation hate him. They don't want to call him an architect. And uh, you, so you get more and more fascinated by early form of architecture, by what happens with a uh, uh, the, the glass house, by means, you get quite critical because you know that you if you take off the glass, you still have the roof and the floor, so it's not really an envelope, it's really a standard classical building. So, and you realize that those materials may have a certain effect, they may the, uh, have certain uh, unusual form of reflection that may have to do with narcissism and so on. Vectors, of course, are about dynamics. Vectors are back to your old heroes and favorites, again, whether it's the Guggenheim Museum in New York or the Carpenter Center in Paris. Vectors start, keep obsessing you. You develop them, not in a compositional uh, ways, but looking at the structural manner the, the, that the way, way it works. For example, here you have tension, so the members are extremely thin, while in this, in, at the center where you have compression, 
the, the, uh, the, 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 the building becomes almost solid. So it is a discussion on structure, not about architecture. That's very different from a similar uh, program by Calatrava, where uh, tension and, and, and compression are not differentiated at all. So you call that formalism. And you explore this notion of, of, of materials. In the case of the glass house, when you're asked to do a pavilion for music and video, you say, now I'm going to do the real glass house because it's made of structural glass, and if I remove the glass, I don't have anything anymore. But you're also obsessed about the program. You bring it so that artists can uh, use it for a variety of purposes, and so is the building this sort of experiment in a, a sort of enclosure which is simultaneously about materializing a concept and uh, triggering uh, events. So the idea of envelope, which and, uh, I, here uh, we will talk about, uh, there's an extraordinary chapter in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Alejandro's uh, piece which takes it miles further. Uh, you, you ask yourself what it is and as soon as you keep doing competitions, uh, you uh, deal with very large buildings. The, by the way, you know that's, that's the only way a young architect with not much of an office can get big jobs, is by doing competitions. And so you uh, uh, discuss the idea of uh, a double envelope with movement vectors in between. Uh, you learn slowly how to build. You try to express the material to an extreme degree because you see that architecture is the concept, the materialization of a concept. So you want to show the concrete. You make this, the 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 uh, the the the, 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 um, the seeds transparent. You turn it, etc. And then, because you did a good job, you asked to do to participate in another competition for a similar program, exactly the same program, the same. Um, uh, you, you know that the previous one worked well, so you are going to make the, the new one with the same concept, but the site is different. And that raises another set of questions, is the notion of context. Does context affect architecture? Does uh, context contaminate a concept? And here in the middle of a forest, you just do blue, you just do, uh, you use wood and, and uh, polycarbonate, uh, you play with the light, you start to ask yourself to which extent there is a distinction between a concept, a percept, what it looks like, and an effect, the emotion that you might get. I'll get back to that. So, uh, in many ways, the exploration, while trying to get away from architecture at every single moment, is sort of starting to look damn much like it. And, but it's still trying to get away from it. For example, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the manufacturing center in, uh, in, uh, in Geneva for a watch company, Vacheron Constantin, tries to not differentiate uh, the workers, the blue collar workers and the white collar workers, has one single wrapping uh, surface. The wrapping surface has a lining which collapses the outer envelope in the inner envelope into one, and then the circulation vectors, the movement vectors, become uh, another material which is glass. So the materialization of the concept becomes very much uh, uh, the theme of the, uh, uh, of the work. And, uh, but inevitably, uh, suddenly, if you, if you realize that the context has had an effect on the concept, then content plays another role. And of course, those triads, those trial trilogies of, uh, you know, you remember Vitruvius and, and beauty, solidity, and, uh, and uh, utility. Uh, you do the same concept, context, content, and you are always amused to see a, 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 a monastery by Le Corbusier being built in Boston as a town hall, or uh, how uh, the, uh, the, the Villa Rotonda moves from one place to another, and how the uh, 
uh, a, a, the typology of a parking of a, of a parking garage can become a museum. So that notion of the contamination between one and the other means that you can take a concept and contextualize it, or the other way around, take a context and conceptualize it. And this is what happened with the, uh, the, the, the museum in Athens. I will not get into detail with it, but the context was so much so filled with constrained archaeological remnants, of course, the, the Parthenon at, at a short distance. So this brings you all the mechanics of deriving a concept out of the constraints of the context. Namely, here the tripartite organization with the glass uh, and, uh, rectangle, uh, looking at the Parthenon with the frieze and uh, the, uh, the sculptures in the intermediate part and of course the part which uh, uh, houses the excavation, you work with the excavation and here in the book I think it's really important to start to show uh, the construction issues that go with it, uh, how uh, you start to use uh, the, 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 the construction uh, constraints and results in order to, um, how could I describe it, uh, to extend the museumness of the museum. In other words, the sculptures, the, uh, uh, you'll see it here a little further, no, I'll, I'll leave it at that. The, the sculptures are using the museum uh, uh, raw concrete as their background. Uh, amusingly enough, the frieze itself uh, that, that the famous Elgin barbels uh, are very much a continuation of your earlier discussion years and years and years earlier about the idea of sequence and uh, that's at that time that you, but this is again, a, 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 it could be a lecture on its own, uh, where you discover that, Alex, uh, that uh, Eisenstein, the filmmaker, uh, actually in a way cribbed the, uh, the famous uh, Elgin marbles for that very f same film, uh, that the, the uh, Alexander Nevsky. So I'll go a little faster on this, but this uh, way to start to discover the extraordinary nature of materials becomes uh, an exciting moment. Once again, you're not trying to do architecture and you get there. So superimposition, it was the name of the game. This goes uh, in other projects like the one in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Beijing where you try to preserve parts of the past and build something on top of it. This idea of context is not only about the physical context, but it's also about the political context. 9-11, uh, we all know it's inside out, all of us who were in the city, and there is a com you know immediately a number of competitions. Uh, uh, people do some extraordinary projects. Uh, at the same time, you feel extremely uh, sort of uneasy about the political discourse that is overlaid over the, uh, the, 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 the reconstruction or about the memorial or about whatever. So you decide to do a project in the Kuleshov sense, in other words, to take that tower, here you design a tri-tower of sorts, and you place it in the context of a Las Vegas-like neighbor -like neighborhood or a patriotic neighborhood or even in a Taliban neighborhood, or if, of course, in a memorial neighborhood. And you realize that every time the building looks different, and yet it is the same building. So somehow, you're never working in the vacuum. Now we get to the end. Uh, it's the time we live in right now. Uh, look at the, 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 the right-hand page. These are icons iconism uh, all over the Middle East or in many places in China and increasingly in this country. So you feel uneasy about it, at the same time you realize you're stuck. That the word that you hated the most, which was the word form, which I haven't used a single time in this discussion, 
uh, is creeping back. Certain type of complexities, uh, uh, when you deal with town buildings, you inevitably will start to have to use the arbitrariness of form, whether it's the concentric or the, uh, the clusters, etc., etc. And you realize that that has been happening for a long, long time. And as you develop certain projects, you, as the larger they are and the further they are, often in cultures that you know nothing about, you have to use that form of abstraction. And here I use it as an abstract notion here uh, in a large town, in a large uh, forest rather, in the Dominican Republic. Form is a device, is an abstract device that is allowing you to order uh, programs, activities, or even urbanism. So the abstraction itself is really what you would call a concept form. Namely, and here amusingly enough, you say hi to Nimaya because you're doing a new town and it's much smaller, of course. But uh, the, the form itself is never an end in itself. It is a mechanic, it's a device in order to organize spaces. And in Alesia, uh, a project uh, that was finished a few uh, months ago, uh, you use simply the uh, very old, very, uh, you know, sort of uh, many millenniums, many thousands of years, uh, as the mode of exploring a typology, exploring the uh, the envelope itself, but why do you do this? Not because you cannot do it any other way, but there is this notion of 360 degrees. You have this notion that you are, I, you are still, in this sense, worried about the idea of facades, so you don't draw facades. You may sometime, if the book, if this book has uh, one day a, a, an appendix or a footnote, it may have a chapter on facades, but you're not ready yet. So you uh, develop different materials that will give you a hint about the mode of construction. By then you've been building for about, time passes, for about 15 years. By, it takes about that long to know what you're doing as an architect. So you know now, you understand how to build, so you use different materials out of the, the end you understand, of course, about the visual effect, about context and concept. This is in a historical part of, a, of, of a, in Burgundy, in France. And you test those movement vectors within those double envelopes and so on. And eventually and finally, you say, hey, the hell with form. I don't want to be caught in it. And so when you're being asked to do a, a new zoo for Paris, you say, oh, ha, now, formless. And so the whole project under construction at the moment is uh, those formless filters. Uh, the, uh, whenever an architect talks about a zoo, they think of Lubetkin, they think of John Haydock or of Cedric Price. Uh, you, uh, here, you try to uh, have a form of organization, which is that since you have to use aviaries, people and animals will be in aviaries. Uh, and uh, if you have to use screens, uh, these screens uh, will be literally uh, not uh, the landscape at the service of the architecture, but the architecture at the service of the landscape. In other words, something which has no identifiable architectural character. And when you arrive at that moment, you ask yourself, yeah, if you're doing a book, if you're trying to string along things as different from uh, the early work of those, you know, uh, diagrams, screenplays, movement vectors of, 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 of taken out of movies, what is the common denominator? Is there a common denominator? 
And that's where the idea of writing a book is really to figure out what is the hell you're doing. And so then, of course, you ask and you like the fact that uh, uh, Alejandro has the same drawing in his book, Saint-Exupéry, The Little Prince. And you ask yourself, of course, what is an architectural concept? Because you say architecture invents concepts and materializing th materializes them by turning them into physical spaces and constructed materials. And then you go back to architectural history, and then you go back to the pyramid and the labyrinth and the, uh, the uh, infinite space of Kisler and the uh, Plan Libre of Le Corbusier and, and, and Louis Kahn and others, and you realize that somewhere there the concept is always there and that the concept does not exist without the percept because at one moment the arch, which is a concept, has to be uh, made into something that is buildable. That's that's it. It looks like something that's that's already a percept, and then eventually it it reeks, it smells, it rots, and that's an effect. And the concept, the eff the, the percept, and the effect become really what you are doing. And uh, so slowly you feel that after all these years you only begin to know what architecture is. And you know there is not one single answer. You know, at the school in Porto, in Portugal, I'm sure they give you a different answer about what architecture is. You heard Soto de Moura the other day, than if you are at the A in London or at, uh, at, uh, at, at Columbia. So, uh, hence, there you sense that something is happening and you notice that you worked with a number of people. Here I have to thank for this book three people who played a major role. Uh, um, Colin Spellman, uh, who helped edit it for, well, helped putting it together, uh, two by four with Michael Rock, who helped design it, and Kate Linker, who uh, gave a number of very, you know, sort of pointed advice and played an important role, a very important. So, and you realize that in the meantime, while you were doing all these competitions, over 66 or 69 competitions, uh, you win about one out of four, uh, you do other projects, you end up doing far more projects than you ever expected you would do, and uh, you are slowly, slowly getting to architecture. Uh, okay, uh, I've been much too long. We will have a, a quick discussion. I'll tell you what the themes are. Uh, the, uh, uh, we discussed, uh, uh, Alejandro and I, and again, uh, I, I, I thank him for, for uh, accepting to do this, uh, this sort of double bill, uh, because uh, uh, th th that question of at a time when nobody reads books anymore, or so some people say, why do people choose to do books? And uh, so that's one of the things that we want to discuss. We want to discuss the biographical component. Uh, we want to discuss whether architecture is architecturally driven or society driven. And then we want to talk a little bit about architecture today. Um, um, uh, what is you know, happening? <laughs> So maybe uh, we'll ask our, each other a question in, in, in turn for about, for, for, for about 15, 20 minutes or less if you are impatient. And then uh, we will have questions from, from you. The first question, then I'll start since I have the <laughs> mic, uh, is of course, uh, why did you decide to do that book at this time? And I mean both your time and the time around you. I, it, I mean, like any of these projects, as you very well know, a book is, uh, is uh, something that takes a long time to happen and, and probably even before it was um, supposed to come out, 
I I had been working on on the book probably for five years, um, uh, and and I I don't know exactly why I started working on it. Probably many people started telling me, well, uh, you've written a lot in a lot of different places, uh, and maybe it's time to uh, to compile all these texts into into a book. Uh, so in, in, in some ways it came, first of all, from outside. This is not a book that is written deliberately as a, as a book, but almost as, a, as an attempt to compile a number of materials that you've been producing uh, over, over the years. And at, at some point, uh, uh, you feel that you need to somehow crystallize it. And, and this is where, where I was saying that I, I then started to, to suspect that when you do that and when you look at your, at your own work with this kind of retroactive uh, uh, perspective, uh, what you are trying to do is some way to consolidate in some, uh, uh, what, what you have been doing, what, uh, what is your uh, identity as an author. In, in your case, I think, you are you are mixing architecture and and writings or text. In in my case, probably um, uh, this is a book that is just about my my written uh, work. I, I I don't know why why do, why do you do a book? I mean, I I I I, I mean I, I have to say something quite interesting. One of the most impressive things that I heard from a, a student uh, quite a few years ago was that. He, he told me, I come from a generation that has never read a book from the beginning to the end. Uh, I just don't have the patience nor the concentration. I, I open, I uh, look at something, and I move to the next thing, or I, I, I browse uh, something on the, on the web. So uh, what I'm saying is that I, I think that the only reason why you would write a book is uh, possibly for yourself, because the yes. way people access access the access the information, it, it has nothing to do with this kind of megalomaniac en enterprise. A absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You you write it in order to figure out what the hell your argument is. Mm. Uh, just uh, as when you're doing a pro even a project, you know, a book is a project. It's not. It's mm. bigger. It's longer. It has more components. But uh, uh, eventually, it has to have some sort of a coherence in, and consistency, even if things have been written for totally different purposes and for totally different. So you look for that, that consistency in order to build up an argument. And so uh, the argument may evolve over time, but when you do the book, uh, it, it has to be coherent, and you explained, for example, very well how you would choose certain typographic uh, techniques in order to reinforce, that's what I would call the materialization of the concept. Yeah. So you, you do that, and uh, in the case of, of, um, of architecture concept, red is not a color, of course it's not the title we used when we were working on it, we called it Z-Book. And we, we just, because we did not really know necessarily where we were going, but we knew that there was that incredible necessity to try to find a thread. And I think that's, that's where it's, it, it, it was for oneself, and then of course, eventually for people to look at it bits and pieces. Right? Mm. Nobody one wants to, write, to read 776 pages all at once and look at 1,500 images. You know. I, I think there is something also very interesting that, that you pointed out in the conversation. Of course, we've done our, our homework and we've talked to each other a little bit <laughs> to know what we were going to, to, to do today. Uh, and Bernard uh, pointed out something quite uh, interesting, which is uh, you, you saw how he, uh, he talked about the book. You say, you do this and you do that and you do and he talks about you as as if there is some sort of distance between the the the, the writer and what comes out of it and i i always say i because <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
obviously because I am in the middle of it. I am trying to uh, 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 shoot at different things, uh, but I, I mean, I, I think this is quite uh, remarkable that you choose to kind of uh, put yourself, uh, and that may may also require some level of consideration. I, I, I'll, 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 I'll tell you something. I haven't told anybody actually that. Uh, the uh, when. Uh, we finished the book, uh, we showed it, I, I'll say hi, to two, uh, to two publishers. And they both accepted it, but one said, at the condition you replace the you, because it's all written, mm. it's the you, you replace the you by the I, so we hear your voice. And I said, no way, and I went to the one who didn't request that change, right? So clearly, of course, that's a literary device. It's a colloquial device, but writing is also about device. But, but in your case, it's, it's almost, I, I think that, uh, that this is a kind of fundamental uh, difference. I think in, in your case, the writing is almost about almost like taking a distance from the, the work. And, and also you have another device that is very present in the book, which is these blue pages, which are, can have some sort of oniric atmosphere about them. It's almost as if you are sleeping and remembering the things that, uh, that uh, were going through your mind. And then there are the white pages, which is where these things actually take uh, place or you see, formalized. I never thought about it this way. I like it. <laughs> I like what you said, right? Uh, it it yeah. is very interesting yeah. that, you, that that uh, actually, you know why uh, the, the, the blue page, uh, I didn't explain this, but every one of these four chapters in, in my book is uh, a slight uh, tinge of, so one, one of them is blue, the other one is slightly red, the other one is slightly green, and the other one is slightly uh, purple, and all together make black. And so the, they are chosen in almost in a kind of in a mechanical uh, way. And so when you say we have we've, we've ended up using the same the same blue, I thought yes, but but in a, in, with a yeah. completely different totally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the the this question about the I uh, and the you uh, brings the the question of the biographical mm. or autobiographical dimension. Uh, you bring, you know, you use the, the, even the expression of the scientific autobiography uh, where you take yourself as the, uh, how could I describe it, as almost the, um, the symptom of a whole generation. In other words, you become a spokesperson and that has fascinated me uh, because, uh, let's say, in my own case, there were people in my generation, like Leon Crea, while he was a friend, uh, would never be someone I would associate <laughs> myself with in terms of the work and the ideologies. So how do you see the, that coalescing of a generation? I, I, I mean, I think that is, a, that is a fundamental generational difference, which is that you belong to a generation that uh, is, uh, and, and you know, going back to the book of, uh, of, uh, of uh, generations, however uh, believable this is or ha however applicable it is to, to the kind of uh, wider uh, context in which we, we are born, uh, I mean, uh, I think it's quite interesting that your generation in that book is the generation of the prophets. And I, and I, and I think that if you look at the, the way your generation has uh, tried to portray itself, is as a series of visionaries that are able to create a world. Uh, and I think yeah. my generation is much more hesitant about about doing that. The, 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 <laughs> the, the, this, I, I mean, the naming is always very tricky, mm -hmm. right? Because, uh, of course, uh, I certainly personally feel much more 
of a just for technical reason of taking an airplane every 10 days, much more of a no man than a sort of prophet with a long beard. Um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, but I'm fascinated by this notion that you can identify generations even though I, again, if I think of people uh, who I was working with at the AA, uh, uh, amusingly enough, I, 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 I often say that at age 29, I knew uh, uh, Tom Main, um, uh, Rem Koolhaas, Zahadid, um, um, basically the, the whole, the, my whole generation, uh, I, I already had met them. Why? Because you know there's a few cities where that's, that's where that things happen, mm -hmm. right? But uh, I think, for example, of the AA, we, were f we never felt as a generation, we were fiercely competitive against one another. We had a lot of respect towards one another. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, I think uh, probably because we were not uh, 68, had really de uh, killed all credibility that the previous generation had. And that's why probably England, that was not politicized, was the only place where you could still deal with architecture. And you could still talk with uh, Cedric, who, Cedric Price, who would be, you know, for me, an older generation. Cedric Price was the age of, of Peter, Peter Eisenman, more or less, plus one, minus two years. Uh, so that was the other generation. But again, within this generation, you, I, I was just, since I knew you were, we were going to talk about that, right? <laughs> I couldn't resist to have somebody in the office to look, you know, at, at, at gener generation and others, you know, and looking at, on one hand, uh, who was in your theory of the cycles, right? If uh, you had the prof prophets, the nomads, the, um, uh, after that, I believe the heroes and then the artists, then if it's a cycle, then the people just say before the prophets, in other words, the generation of Frank Gehry, Peter Eisenman, Richard Meyer, and Norman Foster would be the artist. Mm. Who knows? But then I'm not sure if HOK, SOM, KPF, <laughs> and L, and BBJ are the artists either, right? And that's... Mm. You know. But but I mean I, I, obviously we are we are kind of getting into into uh, uh, talking about the, the the book itself from uh, Strauss and, and how and and obviously there are things that are probably inconsistent. This is a book that is uh, made in order to understand certain markets uh, and to typify buyers yeah. uh, in a way. But if you look, for example, at, at their generation. Uh, one of the things that, that happened to me uh, was that, as I, as I said, I, I, my, my, my professional career came out, uh, uh, developed in a, in, a, in a moment in which we were trying to, in a way, forget, for, forget about being political, forget about uh, being critical, forget about uh, trying to uh, react, uh, just kind of get into there and try to do something. And, and at some point, it was my students who started uh, uh, being critical of that of that position. That that is probably what generated the last part of the book about uh, uh, material politics, uh, because they reveal to me that that uh, that was important. And and if you see what is happening now in the generation that is younger than, than me, what is called the Generation Y, which is what, uh, which would belong in the, in the kind of uh, cyclic uh, uh, description that Stars and Home make about generations, they are, again, you know, they believe in institutions, they believe in, 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 uh, in, uh, in politics, they believe in building up uh, the world again, they believe that they, you have to be critical. Uh, so that made me think that, uh, that maybe, maybe it's not, uh, it's not yeah. so... This is interesting to know whether, the, you know, a, a generation, and I, I, it's not a conversation of generation, we're back to hmm. architecture, and, and is whether you can coalesce, you know, one single movement uh, right as it happens. 
you can do it as a historian, you know, a century later, and that's those oversimplification. But if I think, you know, then I will say of people of my own age rather than my own generation, uh, after uh, after 1968, uh, you, there was you know you, there was this slogan during the events uh, called "Imagination takes power," and we used to say that our generation split between those who went on the side of imagination and those who went on the side of power, <laughs> and they were not the same, frankly, right? So this happened. Amusingly enough, if I continue this this little list. You're going to laugh because if you take, you know, your generation, say, uh, Vinnie Mars, Jesse Reiser, Greg Lynn, mm -hmm. right? Which would be that, that third generation after uh, Eisenman, Meyer, Geary, and my own with uh, Wolf Freak, Skoulas, uh, is, you know, uh, uh, Libeskin Hall, and so on. Um, uh, you have, and then you have another one, hmm which is now, and it's amusing if we had the initial H-O-K-S-O-M-K-P-F, now that fourth generation, you know, they call B-I-G, big, mad, fat, Rex. <laughs> They're all initials, right? <laughs> but these, so, guy, these guys are not the Y generation. Some of them are still uh, my generation. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is really interesting because we had, you know, that a two and a half in between generation, between those that I thought were between my generation and his generation, <laughs> and we realized they were Zaha Hadid, Liz Diller, and Sejima. The three women were part of, and then we, of course, as which if we split it, we, who do we bring with the other one, and who do we bring with the other if we want to do that? So it's an intensely artificial construct which is, like all constructs, useful, right? But it, but it was also very interesting to hear that you thought that your generation had lost all credibility uh, that the previous generation enjoyed? No, I said exactly the opposite. <laughs> 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 that the previous generation, it's not even a question of credibility, did not exist. I think uh, our, uh, if one talks about fathers, uh, they were all dead. And uh, there was no, I think, a, at least in Europe, nobody looked at the Smithson or, you know, even at the Peter Cook. That there was a complete split. It was like a, a so-called, uh, how do you call that, a, a blank plate. Mm -hmm and blank slate. And so that's, that's an unusual situation. I don't think at any moment one was trying to, you know, to kill the father or to, to, to move. That did not exist. Mm. Uh, so it's not even thing, it, they, it was good or it was bad, it did not exist. Um, uh, or at least, let's maybe I'm projecting because, of course, I could say that Alejandro <laughs> is projecting his own view of the world, and I'm projecting my own. But that's something else, right? Uh, let's see. We had we had another, we, yeah. we, we had an, uh, uh, other things which had to do uh, with uh, which. Well, we can ah, yeah, say that, that is an interesting. Um, uh, one which, because then I want to get uh, to, uh, to, to to people from from the audience. Uh, I have just uh, there were two that I thought could be interesting: the the issue of fabrication, the small versus large, and and possibly also the issue of teaching, since we're both involved in that. But but, but I, I I think that there is you you said uh, architecturally driven and, and society driven, which I think is a, is a is a very okay. interesting also co uh, question between the two the two books. Yeah, because. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you, your book is called Concepts, and your writing is has this kind of uh, conceptual distance and, and disciplinar uh, purpose, uh, and yet all the concepts that are in the book are very concrete, very, very architectural, and and I'm almost like on 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 the other 
on the other side, perhaps my, my own practice is much less uh, driven by concepts and much more driven by, by uh, getting into, into the, the construction and the making of the, of the project. And, 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 and then the chapters of my book or, or the way I, I mean, it's slightly different because mine is a textbook and yours is a more comprehensive uh, book. But I end up talking about not architectural concepts. That's uh, that's correct. In a, at the same okay, uh, uh, because of the extraordinary uh, rich uh, you know makeup of, of your book, you actually touch about uh, certain material devices, certain mm -hmm. strategies yeah. that are about you know uh, the, the society we live in today, but that are translated architecturally, but you also take a much more, if you want, sociological yeah. uh, 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 view, uh, which obviously, probably, because of uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the writers that one was the most fascinated with, uh, Lefebvre or Castells mm -hmm. or, 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 or those uh, uh, people who talked critically about the city, were actually uh, 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 you knew that it was telling you about how the mechanism worked, but it was not telling you how to go beyond it. Right? Mm. And I think that's, that's where the, the question, I, I enormously appreciate it. I, I, I think the two are complementary. There's no way of saying one is better than the other. The, the two are absolutely necessary and quite often give you a fantastic sort of... Uh, 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 I, I think uh, your, your text called The Politics of the Envelope and bringing the most uh, uh, unlikely uh, form of reasoning by talking the X, Y, Z dimension and giving it political uh, significance, I think it's both completely hysterical and s absolutely stunningly beautiful and, and, and okay. important. Right? Maybe we should... You, you wanted to... Uh, you wanted yeah. to... I, I think we'll leave it to the other and we can pick yeah. up something. Um, ah, so I guess I thought this was really interesting because you both are architects and you both are writing and um, there's like a similar, and you repeatedly, both of you talked about how long it takes for a book to be finished, but at the same time as architects, you probably understand how long it takes a building to be finished. And so I guess, um, the very simple question, what was like your process or how did you feel that process differ in terms of, you know, would you make a building as if you would write a book or would you write a book as if you would make a building or vice versa? And how do you feel that kind of thing happens for you? Also because I think um, if, if, you know, concepts are, uh, if buildings are materializations of concepts and in this book you're trying to use pre-existing material, of course a different kind of material that you've made and then try to create, make a concept from the end of it, as you said. So I guess, in terms of that, how do you relate like the process of making or designing architecture to the process of writing a book? You want to start? Uh, yeah. Uh, mm, I, I think that making a book and making a, a building are, are uh, two, different, two different things. Uh, there are probably some uh, similarities in the way you organize uh, materials. Uh, for example, I wouldn't say that buildings are materializations of, of concepts. I, I may, and this is this is why I, I thought it was it was important uh, to point at the fact that uh, Bernard uh, said that and, and titled the, the the book concept and in a way explained uh, in in a, almost like a, like a, a historical way his own his own making and how he he develops concepts and then they become buildings and out of the buildings there are concepts and and so there is a concatenation there uh, that that is read in a in a in a very uh, uh, in the book obviously I'm sure in reality it was not as organized but in in the book uh, you always post post uh, uh, rationalize it uh, but probably I would say that sometimes um, concepts are the materialization of buildings, and, and I think that you probably has, have also the same experience. And I, I, I mean, there are the, the world of 
of architectural concepts is full of examples where uh, concepts emerge out of the fact that you are suddenly faced with a, with a very concrete and specific problem of making a building. I, I, I completely agree with the reverse formulation that you can very much you know, derive a concept from a building. In other words, the concept as is born out of the building. Uh, so uh, that, that's, that's perfectly, you know, uh, that's really important. Probably the reason why I wanted to use the word concept was related to the fact that uh, today, and that's when we would talk, talk about the situation of, of uh, architecture in 2012, uh, the, the, the prevalence of images, uh, what I call this iconism, uh, it has mean, meant that often uh, the image itself uh, is nothing but the image. Mm. And that, uh, uh, so wanting to reclaim a territory for architecture is the territory of thought and the ter territory of ideas uh, was the reason to put you know, the, the, the word in the title. Um, uh, there could be other, you know, there is a lot of other, other ways to, to, to try to give an umbrella because you, you know, you give the snipers which is a great title, but uh, you, uh, you need to, to give that umbrella and then that umbrella helps you to structure your argument, right? Back to your question, uh, yes, uh, I would say it's very different from doing a building, but it's not so different either. It's a project, you know? For example, now, uh, Alejandro has a new project. He's the dean at the School of Architecture in Princeton. And he may know what his project is. He may actually know and not tell you. <laughs> He may not know and tell you retroactively five years from now, like many of us do, right? <laughs> so uh, th that's, that's how you know, it goes. So I, I think a book, a, a building, a school, they are projects. And projects are so important because that's what you yeah, project, you project yourself. That's what you do as an architect. I yeah. think that's, the, that's yeah. the very core of the, of the practice, to do projects. I think there are not too many professions or activities, whatever, that work based on the idea of project, of that project. I think there were more questions. Yeah, yeah. And then Because it's black speaking in the second person. And I think that uh, tonight was interesting because um, I think a lot of your work is sort of almost as if it's in the second person. And then later on you sort of look at form and it's a foray into the first person and that's difficult. And now with the inform maybe it's something else. And I guess for both of you, you alluded to sort of generation, but if you speak of persona, where having done the book, where is your persona now and how does it work in relation to your architecture as, as deans or former deans? Uh, you know, this being the end of one sort of chapter, where, where are you going? Uh, this is a great question. Are you a different person now that you've finished the book? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, I am. I'm much more relaxed. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, I mean, in, in some ways, you you uh, close down the 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 book, and obviously, you are carrying with you all all those all those issues that that were already with uh, with you. But but this is in in some ways why why I became interested in in accepting that that uh, the, the primary purpose of, uh, of uh, doing this book is to compile things and try to organize them and, and also try to put them in the public. I, I mean, as much as we may think, or we may try to say we are doing this for the good of architecture, we are also doing it because we want to uh, uh, consolidate what we 
uh, what we've been doing into something that, that is recognizable and is visible uh, and is communicable to, uh, to others. In one of your works, the, the advertisements for architecture, uh, you say that architecture is defined by the things it witnesses as much as by the enclosure of its walls. So there's this importance of um, the body, if you want, as, as an agent of architectural consequences, right? So I'm thinking people in the city as agents that have architectural consequences in space. So when we see um, things as Occupy Wall Street, that people are behaving differently in space. If you, um, if you think this is a potential um, architectural um, innovation, a way to think space different, and also if you think that the repression that a NYPD, um, you know, they repressed it very violent, violently, if you think this kind of repression is also a limit to ar the architectural um, developments in New York City, especially coming from you as a person who lives between Europe and United States, if you consider that this kind of repression is, le uh, is less in Europe and this factor allows more freedom in architectural production. I, I think the, the example that you're uh, using is, is very appropriate. You know, what happened uh, in Sukoti Park and the, the whole uh, Occupy uh, movement. Because that's the moment when, for example, uh, what uh, I may be interested in to the relationship between spaces and what happens in them, and what Alejandro is dealing with when he's talking about the relationship between an economic, a political, and a social situation, tend to have incredible uh, implications about the makeup of cities. Uh, in other words, the legal framework of Sukoti Park was what allowed a, a particularly important moment in, you know, energize a number of, uh, of people using the city and its legal constraints or opportunities as a means to do something entirely new and entirely different that nobody had thought about before. And I thought that was incredibly creative. And uh, in a way, uh, showing that uh, you know, there's a long way in front of us in inventing things which are either architectures or political movements taking advantage of already all these constraints. So I think we take Just, one last question. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, I would like to um, to make it in French, if, is it, uh, if it is possible. Um, maybe Bernard um, I'll translate uh, perhaps could translate. translate, yes. Uh, 2012 est, est, est pour moi, donc l'année 2012, ce qu'a été 84 uh, pour vous. Donc uh, c'est deux dates, uh, deux années remarquables. Et je voulais savoir le cap uh, de la quarantaine pour un architecte, uh, pour vous particulièrement, est-ce que uh, c'est quelque chose de, de significatif euh, euh, donc, en termes de génération, donc euh, c'est le but de ma question. Uh, uh, I have yeah. another question for, for Alejandro. <coughs> we, we don't see the, the, the picture for, uh, of Bernard in your book, so uh, <laughs> we see many <laughs> many other architects. But he is he is uh, in the list of people okay. that I that I uh, name as uh, important uh, people for the book. <laughs> And, and anyway, you know, I, I brought the only red thing that uh, <laughs> <laughs> in in his uh, honor Good tonight. Good thank, you, thank you, thank you. Uh, his his question in French is actually uh, applicable in a way uh, uh, to anybody of us who is uh, over the age of forty. Is whether uh, the the age of forty for an architect is particularly significant uh, as one's development. So I can ask you, I'll tell you in my case, but uh, go ahead. So, sorry, uh, the, 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 40, the, the age of 40, 40 is, is it a particularly significant age for an architect? Uh, 
Mm, no. <laughs> no, no, not necessarily. I think. I mean, probably this has uh, also varied uh, across the the ages. No, some in some ages probably it was more significant than than in other ages. Uh, there are people who mature later. I, I I'm not I'm not sure, but. I, I, I think if you look historically, you know, they, uh, they are heroes who died, you know, at age 35. And uh, it's clear that uh, you get a better chance to become a famous architect if you live long, right? <laughs> uh, the, and then, uh, you know, uh, no, 40, look, Louis Kahn, uh, 55, uh, uh, Frank uh, does his first significant building. Uh, uh, Frank Gehry, uh, Bilbao, he's already 60. Uh, and some people are, you know, young geniuses, whatever. You know, I don't think it has much of a, uh, it takes a while, it takes a little longer than if you are an artist or a writer, but uh, otherwise, uh, there are too many examples and counter examples. Yeah, and I think, of course, the, what, the reason we've stayed here so long is because these are two counter examples. How old were you when you did Yokohama competition? 31. See, but so even though he wins the competition at 31, <laughs> he hesitates. He's so trained in architecture that he, he cannot simply say 40 is irrelevant, <laughs> even though it was nine years before. And Bernard, in the opposite way, gets younger by the minute, as, you, as all of you who are here know. <laughs> I, I think what, what I was saying at the beginning is still true that, um, and you both exhibited this tonight, which is that you both share a kind of addiction to clarity, and you will, you kind of urgent, almost urgently like to divide things. Even the struggle about generations is kind of, I can imagine them arguing for years about exactly where to draw the line. But they will want to draw the line um, and so, of course, the paradox is that these two people that are so good at reducing complex situations down to very elemental formulas write such large books, <laughs> right? So, so the question is, what is the relationship between the desire to say big things in the smallest possible space and how, in the end, they occupy such a large amount of space doing that, which in this case was a large amount of time, which was two hours, I was in a, in a concert by Keith Jarrett in New Zealand years ago, and we squeezed about three encores out of, out of him, brilliant. And then he said at, at the end, there is such a thing as overeating and, <laughs> and uh, left. But I just want to say there is also such a thing as undereating. So I think it would be probably best for us to um, transition at this point and to thank our two wonderful speakers. Thank you. 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 Thank you.